I'm not going to stand here and bore you with the history of the Civil War because we'll be here all night. Um, suffice to say, in the 1640s, uh, 1630s, 1640s, and 50s, there was a series of in interconnected conflicts in the British Isles and Ireland in which a significant proportion of the population of uh, this country died. It was a watershed moment for England, for Wales, for Scotland and for Ireland. It left us with a legacy that continues to this day. Anybody needs to look at the news um, to see what is going on at the moment and hear the echoes back to the, uh, the civil strife of the mid 17th century. But who were the levellers? To their supporters, they were common men who asked only for a greater say in the affairs of state. To their detractors, they were dangerous radicals, hell-bent on destroying private property and upsetting the natural order. To history, they would be martyrs, and to many, an inspiration. In reality, they were what we would today call a grassroots movement, one that grew and evolved and eventually reached such a crescendo that in the words of the martyred New Model Army Colonel Thomas Rainsborough's epitaph, they made king, lords, commons, judges shake. The natural order had already been shaken by the chaos and bloodshed of the First Civil War, and those who felt they had paid the highest price for Parliament's victory, the common soldiers, watched as their paymasters not only did not pay them, but negotiated with the king that they had just defeated. The levellers were not, however, just a military movement. Soldier and civilian alike were inspired by the words of pamphleteers such as John Milburn, Richard Overton, William Walwyn and John Wildman. And they were not a political party in the modern sense, but an idea, one of liberty for all Englishmen, not just the rich and powerful. The Agreement of the People, published in 1647, detailed the movement's demands, which to our modern ears seem almost simplistic. The vote given to a greater number of people. Governments elected by, by popular mandate. Religious toleration. And a fair and equal legal system. These were all easily summed up by Rainsborough's reply to the army's commanders at the seminal moment of the debates in a church in Putney in 1647. He said, I think that the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he. And therefore, truly, sir, I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put himself under that government. Amongst the increasingly resentful soldiers of the New Model Army, this notion found fertile soil and, as expected, this caused profound shock in their commanders. For many soldiers, their adherence to the movement was, at least initially, pragmatic. They wanted their arrears of pay. They asked for indemnity for acts committed during the war, and they refused to wage war in Ireland. But whatever its practical beginnings, it soon developed into something wider. A revolutionary moment that threatened to dash the established social order on the rocks of republicanism. At Putney, the arguments of their supposed social superiors were laid bare as reactionary, counter-revolutionary, and inherently conservative. But this revolution was not to be. We meet here in Burford, because in this very churchyard, ringleaders of a mutiny at Banbury were executed. Discipline in the army was restored, and the, the movement lost its momentum. The levellers would never see the world they dreamt of. Thirteen years later, a king sat again on the throne of England, attended by lords and commons, overseeing a national conformist church. We now see the levellers in relief after centuries of radical movements such as the liberals, the chartists, the suffragettes, the socialists, many of whom claimed ideological lineage back to the levellers' cry for liberty. Even the US Constitution contains the echoes of their words more than a century and a half later. The words I'm going to speak in a moment from an agreement of the people 
represent a moment when the voice of ordinary men was heard loud and forcefully. A voice calling for fundamental, radical change. Demanding, insisting that the world could be different. It could be better. The levellers may have ultimately fallen, but in the end, we live in a world that they might at least celebrate, if not recognise. And these are the words from the agreement of the people. Having by our late labours and hazards made it appear to the world at how high a rate we value our just freedom, and God having so far owned our cause as to deliver the enemies thereof into our hands, we do now hold ourselves bound in mutual duty to each other, to take the best care we can for the future, to avoid both the danger of returning into a slavish condition and the chargeable remedy of another war. For as it cannot be imagined that so many of our countrymen would have opposed us in this quarrel if they had understood our own good, so may we safely promise to ourselves that when our common rights and liberties shall be cleared, their endeavours will be disappointed that seek to make themselves our masters. Since therefore our former oppressions and scarce yet ended troubles have been occasioned either by want of frequent national meetings in council or by rendering those meetings ineffectual, we are fully agreed and resolved to provide that hereafter our representatives be neither left to an uncertainty for the time nor made useless to the ends for which they were intended, in order whereunto we declare that the power of this and all future representatives of this nation is inferior only to those who chose them and doth extend without the consent or concurrence of any other person or person to the enacting, altering and repealing of laws, to the erecting and abolishing of offices and courts, to the appointing, removing and calling to account magistrates and officers of all degrees, to the making of war and peace, to the treating with foreign states and generally to whatsoever is not expressly or impliedly reserved by the representative to themselves. Which are follows. One, that matters of religion and the ways of God's worship are not all entrusted by us to any human power, because therein we cannot remit or exceed a tittle of what our consciences dictate to be the mind of God without willful sin. Nevertheless, the public way of instructing the nation, so it be not compulsive, is referred to their discretion. Two, that the matter of impressing and constraining any of us to serve in the wars is against our freedom, and therefore we do not allow it in our representatives. The rather, because money, the sinews of war, being always at their disposal, they can never want numbers of men apt enough to engage in any just cause. Three, that after the dissolution of this present Parliament, no person, be, uh, no person be at any time questioned for anything said or done in reference to the late public disturbances, otherwise than in execution of the judgment of the present representatives. Four, that in all laws made or to be made, every person may be bound alike, and that no tenure, estate, charter, degree, birth or place to confer any exemption from the ordinary course of legal proceedings whereunto others are subjected. Five, that as the laws ought to be equal, so they must be good and not evidently destructive to the safety and well-being of the people. These things we declare to be our native rights and therefore are agreed and resolved to maintain them with our utmost possibilities against all opposition whatsoever, being compelled thereunto not only by the examples of our ancestors whose blood was often spent in vain for the recovery of their freedoms, suffering themselves through fraudulent accommodations to be still deluded of the fruit of their victories, but also by our own woeful experience who having long expected and dearly earned the establishment of these certain rules of government are yet made to depend for the settlement of our peace and freedom upon him that intended our bondage and brought a cruel war upon us. We desire you may understand the reason of our extracting some principles of common freedom out of those many things proposed to you in the case of the army truly stated. It's chiefly because of these things we first engaged 
against the king. He would not, he would not permit the people's representatives to provide for the nation's safety by disposing of the militia and other ways according to their trust, but raised a war against them. And we engaged for the defence of that power and right of the people in their representatives. Therefore, these things in the agreement, the people are to claim as their native right and price of their blood, which you are obligated absolutely to procure for. And these being the foundations of freedom, it is necessary that they should be settled and alterably, which can by no means be but by this agreement with the people. These words echo down to us from the past in Burford and throughout the country. A government only by the consent of those governed. It is a privilege to be here as members of the SEAL, not as English Civil War enthusiasts, um, for the launch of a new team that pays tribute to the level of martyrs that were executed just outside here in Burford. And it is wonderful that the team badge bears words from Rainsborough's tomb, valiant and true.